Borden of Yale, 09, The Life That Counts, by Mrs. Howard Taylor, printed in 1926. Introduction. When the death of William Whitting Borden was cabled from Egypt, it seemed as though a wave of sorrow went round the world. There was scarcely a newspaper in the United States that did not publish some account of a life which had combined elements so unusual, and letters from many lands attested the influence of its high ideals and unselfish service. It is probably true, as was stated in the Princeton Seminary Bulletin, that no young man of his age had ever given more to the service of God and humanity. For Borden not only gave his wealth, but himself, in a way so joyous and natural that it was manifestly a privilege rather than a sacrifice. From Chicago, the city of his birth, came the following testimony. A f church friend of mine, working in the office of the Western Union Telegraph Company, was much tried by the scoffing of an unbeliever concerning everything to do with religion. Whatever might be said on the other side was met with argument and denial. My friend, though an intelligent man and an earnest Christian, had little time for general reading and did not know of your son until an account of his consecrated life appeared in the daily paper. Upon reading it, he at once felt that it might mean something to this unbeliever, so he laid the paper on his desk and awaited results. The scoffer read the article through, then coming to my friend said, I cannot understand it. There is no accounting for such a life. He was completely silenced by the revelation of the power of God in the life your son lived. This is a small incident, madam, but my friend has been deeply impressed, and with me, rejoices to know that Mr. Borden's biography is to be published. A Richmond journal reaching a hundred thousand young people in the South admitted that Borden's theory of converting his many possessions of talent, vigorous strength and wealth into eternal values might not accord with the popular receipt of making the most of his life. But, the editorial continued, even though he was cut off in his early prime before actually reaching his distant sphere of labor, it is doubtful whether any life of modern times has flung out of the world a more inspiring example. His investment has borne rich returns already and will continue to yield its peculiar fruit. There are thousands of talented and favored young men who will, in the light of Borden's conception of investment values, come to a new view of Christian service. Material wealth and natural endowments will be appraised not by a standard of self-indulgence or worldly ambition, but by their adaptability for building the kingdom of God. Here for was a fearless spirit, not feathered by worldly vision in the disposition of his powers and possessions, who looked out and up beyond all these and grasped the really great thing of value for which to spend them. It was not the million dollars that came to this young American, commented another editor, which made this life of victory and his death a worldwide call to young men and women to learn the secret of that victory. It was in things that every man can share that William Borden found in the way of the life which is Christ and the death which is gain. And China and the Muslim world shall yet share that gain as his burning torch is used to kindle in other lives the fires of the like passion for Jesus Christ. Borden of Yale, 09. Chapter 1. Boyhood. Born November 1, 1887. Quote, Out of the heart are the issues of life. Unquote. Proverbs 4.23. There must be beginnings. To those who knew Borden only in student days, it may seem out of keeping with such virility and strength 
to present him as a child. Yet childhood comes first and is full of the germs and seeds of later developments. While he was a sophomore at Yale, for example, an unexpected discovery connected him in an interesting way with the curly-headed little fellow of ten years previously. His elder brother had recently married and in preparing the Chicago home for the occupancy occupation of the young couple had papers come to light that recalled a long past experience. One Sunday afternoon when William was only six Mrs. Borden had gathered the children around her as usual for a scriptural lesson. Several cousins of their own ages were with them, the eldest being about eleven. A propos of something in the lesson, Mrs. Borden suggested that they should each take a slip of paper and write down what they would most like to be when they grew up. This was done in a serious spirit. No one saw what the others had written, and all the slips were put away in a sealed envelope and forgotten. When found ten years later and returned to those who had written them, the ideals of those early days proved to have been realized to a remarkable degree. One boy had wanted to be a gentleman like his father. One of the girls wished to travel abroad, another, quote, to help God and the soldiers of my country." Unquote. All through the World War, the latter was to render exceptional service. And William had written, I want to be an earnest man when I grow up, and true and loving and kind and faithful man. To his last day, by the grace of God, the man could have looked into the eyes of the child without shame. Borden's love of a good rough house was early foreshadowed by his devotion to active and even dangerous games. He was a regular little monkey, his mother recalled, for running round and having a good time. His cousin, John Whitney, was his chief ally in escapades of all sorts. Together, they attended successful schools in Chicago. Footnote. William attended the university school and the Latin and manual training schools in Chicago before going to the Hill School, Pottstown, Pennsylvania. End of footnote. And, with another companion, spent their holidays in congenial ways. It was nothing unusual for the three to start out on Saturday at 5 a.m., ending up at supper time. John Whitney tells us a dead out tired. We found that by the use of ropes we could travel along the roofs of the houses in Bellevue Place, almost the entire length of the block. For a time, this afforded us considerable amusement. Another diversion was to go down to the river and put in the day knocking around among the boats tied to the various docks. We used to go all over the boats, climbing the riggings, etc. The noon meal we would get what, wherever we could, generally from the kitchen of one of the three houses. Late one Saturday afternoon, we decided that we wanted to play in the gymnasium of the school William and Kelso attended. That the building was locked up for the weekend made no difference. We found the cover of a coal hole loose and dropped in through that. We fooled around the gym until tired, then took a leisurely shower and dressed, not realizing how late it was. We got out by a window which had to leave unfastened. I was visiting William at the time, and when we reached home, about 7.30 p.m., we were met by Mr. and Mrs. Borden, worried and almost alarmed over our non appearance When the cause of our tardiness was discovered, we were promptly sent to bed with bread and milk for supper. It was meant for punishment, but nothing could have suited us better. We were tired and hungry, and while it was only bread and milk, the supply was unlimited. 
a marked characteristic of Borden in later life, was his unflinching loyalty to the doing of hard things. Fishing, hunting, sailing, all had their attraction for the boy, as may be seen from his early letters, but he seems to have loved hard jobs best of all. When he and his cousin, for example, discovered a wreck after a terrible storm, and the lakeshore drive was flooded and covered with debris, it was second nature to turn in at once and help. A ship loaded with lumber had gone to pieces, and the great timbers were lying at all angles along the shore. Seeing from the windows the work that had to be done, the little fellows of seven or eight were soon out in the storm, gathering up the lumber and putting it in orderly piles. A gang of Italian laborers appeared before long, but William and John Whitting kept on working, and at the end of the day lined up with the others and received their pay. A chief enjoyment when about ten years old was to go down on Saturday to their uncle's foundry, some distance from Chicago, and spend their holiday working around the men. Uh, of this they never seemed to tire. The house of an uncle in Indiana also offered attractions along the line of work and that of all sorts. It was a farm to which, as a child, William had often been sent to escape the severe winds of Chicago Springs. Of these visits, his aunt wrote, He was never idle, always inclined to make work his play and to find in work well done amp compensation for his efforts. I remember that on his visit in the spring of 1898, William wanted to make cider. His uncle told him that after years of neglect, the elder press was unfit for use and could never be made sufficiently clean again. But William cleaned the cider press. I can see the little fellow now making many trips up the hill for hot water, carrying his buckets two at a time. After several hours of scraping and scrubbing, the press was spotless and cider making began. On a visit in the spring of 1900, when he was 12, William was up at sunrise and in the barn before the men arrived, beginning their day's work for them. This was the time he took such interest in the McKinley's sawmill, making strawberry boxes, going to work, and stopping with the mill whistle. At the end of his visit, Mr. McKinley handed him a sum of money, saying he had earned it, but William declined payment on the ground that it had been a privilege to learn. On his last day with us, May 1912, he was the same dear, affectionate, loving boy as of old. He arrived at 6 a.m., and we had an early breakfast, after which we went out to the porch and William saw the teamster, an old man of 75 who had been in the employ of the family for about 40 years, driving towards the corn cut. William hailed him joyously, jumped off the porch, ran down the hill, and was soon beside him on the wagon. Gently he put his arm round the old man's shoulders, and when they reached the corn cob, he took the shovel and filled the wagon with corn, driving off with him and emptying the load at its destination. He then went over to the McKinley sawmill, greeting many, many acquaintances and helping them in their work as in earlier years. I always think of William as I used to see him when a boy, coming home after a day's work in his blue sweater, rosy cheeks, eyes full of love and hair covered with shavings, calling to me as he started to run up the hill, hoping he had not detained supper. Was there ever another boy of his means so humble, with a heart so full of love and such pure thoughts? One of the deepest things in Borden's life was devotion to his mother, and that, too, was very manifest in the child. From the time when he used to play quietly in her room, not to disturb her writing, and even his toys would steal up behind her chair to raise the wavy hair at the back of her neck and kiss her without a word. On to the days of bereavement after his father's death, when he made time in the midst of college claims and studies to write to her every day, he was more like a lover than a son. 
This attitude comes out in his very first letter, written when just five years old. November 23, 1892 Dear Mama, I send my love to you. I wish you would come to my house. Sorry that you don't come home. Well, I am. And a little later on her birthday. Dear Mama, I did not have any time to give you. I am very sorry that I did not anything for you. So I give you a bunch of flowers in this letter. Goodbye from William Borden. He was quite a correspondent, even in those days. And the observation and attention to detail apparent in his early letters gave promise of the man whom nothing escaped. 89 Belleville Place. Dear Grandmama, how are you feeling? I think the baby is awful cunning. It was a little cold in her head. She is 19 inches long and weighs 6 pounds. One day the butcher came in and found the maids all so happy because it was a little baby. So he told Mrs. Hatch and Mrs. Hatch told Mrs. Stone and Mrs. Stone told Mrs. Sheldon. Goodbye from William Borden. Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Dear Grandmother, Papa bought a new sailboat for us. We have sailed down to Golf Club and back twice. The first day we fished, I caught 11 fish, Papa 11, John 3. The baby has been in the bathtub for the first time. Miss Duns has gone. Every night the baby comes downstairs and Mama reads John Halifax out loud to us. Papa bought a new covered carriage for Mama and the baby. We are going Crisco fishing today. Yours truly, W. Borden. 98 Belleville Place, January 1898. Dear Papa, I hope you and your father are feeling well and enjoying your visit to New York. Saturday, January 15th, it snowed all day nearly. Friday, the 14th, we had 13 children here and played all sorts of games. After everybody was gone and everybody asleep except Marie, Mama and myself, we smelt gas and went searching all over the house trying to find it. We did not find it, but opened some windows. By that time, it was 12 o'clock. It was snowing when I went to bed, and on Saturday, as I told you before, in the morning, we went out by the build out and coasted down from day hills upon a pond of ice. They were skating, but it was not good, so we didn't go. About 10 o'clock, we came back and hitched down wagons. One time I got laughing so I couldn't hold onto my rope and let go, and then I couldn't run fast enough to catch up with it again. In the afternoon, a lot of boys were out hitching, and we all hitched our sleds together and made a long train that reached from our house to the manors nearly. I was in the front and it pulled my arms nearly off. Kelso was at the end and it switched him all over into the curbstones and everywhere. We had supper at 7 o'clock. Your loving son, William Whitney Borden. The baby is just as sweet as can be. Hair is all curled. Borden, Indiana. Dear Mama, we have arrived here safe and sound. The train was 20 minutes late. Late. After breakfast, John and Papa went hunting. I did not go with them. Papa shot one bird. He was a nice fat quail, and that is all they got. After lunch, John and I went out and shot at a target with their rifle and revolver, and Papa went off hunting, but did not get anything. He was He's asleep now, and it is just 20 minutes to 5, and it's getting dark. This is written on Wednesday. Your loving son, W.W. W. Borden. Borden, Indiana. Dear Mama, Monday I was down at Mr. McKinley's sawmill. They sawed long boards off and made short ones for crates, and me and another man stacked them up. In the afternoon I went with John McKinney up on the knobs of hay. The roads were very muddy, and we had to let the horses rest. When we got back, they had the big rip saw going. Monday morning, Mr. Burns and I fed the pigs and then began to boil some potatoes for them. 
We built such a big fire that they boiled over and put part of the fire out. Tuesday morning, Fraulein and Mary went out walking, and I went down to the sawmill and stayed all morning. They have been getting a drag saw ready, and we'll have it going before we get back in the afternoon. We were sawing a big red oak, and nearly in the middle, we found two big bullets. The saw had sawed them in two. It took an hour to get through sawing that one big law. Hope all are well. Your loving William. Written Tuesday. Elkhorn, London, Estate Park, Colorado. Dear Grandma, I hope you are feeling well. The third day that we were up here, Papa, Mary, and I went fishing over to the Big Thompson which is about half a mile south of our house but we didn't catch anything a little while after that we went fishing again and john caught 10 but the rest of us didn't catch anything about two weeks ago this being tuesday the 18th john mary ella james and i went out after some of james horses we went out about two o'clock and we hunted the country high and low all over Be beaver flat and didn't get home until 8 o'clock, and Papa was just starting out in the buggy after us. Now I'm going to tell you where we went and what we did. Well, first we forded the Fall River and rode way up into Horseshoe Park, but we didn't find the horses there. So we came back and crossed the river in a place where it was pretty deep, and then we had to go through a lot of brushes, which nearly swept us off our saddles. Then we crossed the river right near Deer Mountain. We found to get across into Beaver Flat that we had to go across a rail fence. So John took off some of the rails but one, and then the horses jumped or stepped over the one. Well, we went on and came to another rail fence and managed it in the same way. Then we came to the barbed wire fence. Well, we managed to pull up one of the poles and laid it down and made the horses go over all but mine whose name was buckskin and he positively refused to go over and in trying to make him go over we backed off and pulled him into the barbed wire and tore his pants and cut his finger well seeing my horse wouldn't go over I had to go back and get out as best I could I then rode up into Beaver Flat about three miles, and it was just about halfway back when I met John, Ella, and Mary. We went back where I'd been, only we went further, but could not find the horses, so we went home. On Saturday the 22nd, there was going to be a baseball game, so we all went to the hay racks. We stopped at the post office and got some balls, and most everybody brought candy and gum and treated everybody to it. We got to the field, which was up the Thompson a little way. They started to make the diamond. It began to rain, and everybody that could got under the wagon. It stopped after a while, and they practiced. I will give you a copy of the scorecard. We won, as you will see, and coming back yelled, Rip tack, sip tack, sis bumba. Here I say goodbye, your loving grandson. William W. Borden. It was a happy, wholesome life, and in their father the children had an understanding friend. Every night he worked with them over their lessons, and they knew that he was no less interested in their games and sports. He was a man of few words, but the intimacies of home life revealed the strength and ability of his character. The following lines gives an impression of his influence over his children. They were written by William's elder sister, while still at Vassar College. O Lord, I thank Thee that Thou gavest me the strength to cling to all my childhood years, this noble man my father, mine to be, though not as now mine through eternity. See, Lord, I am almost smiling through these tears, for Thou hast made me rich of all mankind by giving me to be his daughter friend. For his was very calm nobility of mind, that selfless saw the truth and gave clear line, full justice unto all things to the end. 
a sense of justice born of a proud heart that loved a few dear ones how sacredly silent and grave long hours he spent apart in thought until a word of love would start a deep sweet look behind his eyes and he would sit with us and talk from his great store of beauty poetry and of great men and as the days and years opened the door of his dear heart to me i loved him more as i had more of love to give and then then lord you took him from me and i wept it seemed so piteous for i loved him so until i fell upon my knees and cried a little child to thee and wearied slept while quiet drifted off like cooling snow upon my troubling heart a voice then said dear child give me yourself and all your fears he now is living loving you not dead for him for you for this my blood was shed and i awoke strange smiling through my tears some of his strongest traits born inherited through his father who came of old puritan stock for the love of conquest which had taken the borden of Bourdonnais to England with the Norman Duke 1066 which followed centuries later by the love of freedom which made them exiles for conscience sake to exchange the rich pastures and woodland of Kent for the barren shores and tangled woods of New England which was no easy step but Richard and John Borden who seemed to have been brothers were driven to it by the distress of the times the burning of heretics had ceased in their day but obstacle and persecutions were still the common lot of dissenters. And so it came about that the first child born of European parents in Rhode Island, 1638, was Matthew, third son of Richard Borden. Much interesting information is available concerning the family, for at an early period they joined the Society of Friends, whose practice it is to keep careful records concerning its members. Glad should every Borden be that his ancestors were Quakers, writes this historian in California. And as one turns her illuminating pages, noting the contribution of generation after generation to the development of this great country, one cannot but echo the sentiment. The tendency of the family was always to move north westward, and in the sixth generation of a certain John Borden settled in Indiana who was the great-grandfather of William Borden of this record. Of his mother's side, Borden came of a long line of soldiers, magistrates, and preachers, reaching back to the early annuals of English history. To the best blood of the old country was in their veins, but the terrible years of Archbishop Laud's administration, 1628 to 1640, had driven them too far from the land they loved. Colonel William Whitney, who bought the name to America, belonged to the Suffolk branch of the family and came with his family and his wife, Susanna, from Yarthmouth on the East Coast. With about a hundred others, they founded the city of Hartford, Connecticut, and became members of the first church established there under the animated and able ministry of the Reverend Thomas Hooker. Three generations later, Charles Whitney married the beautiful Elizabeth Bradford, a descendant of Governor William Bradford of Plymouth Colony and of John Alden, who won as his bride the Puritan maid Priscilla. The sons of this Charles Whitney, himself a soldier, lived in the stormy days of the Revolutionary War and bore a brave part in its vicissitudes. A tribute is paid to one of them, William Bradford Whitney, in the family records where he is spoken of as a gentleman and a Christian, an upright, honorable man, possessing great dignity of manner and such integrity of character that his very presence was a rebuke to the wicked. In midlife, he moved his home from Connecticut to Cana, a beautiful part of the state of New York, which thus became the residence of Mrs. Borden's more in intimate, immediate ancestors. William Bradford Whitney's descendants moved with the times, and the old homestead at Cana was forgotten 
for regions further west. Detroit was more, little more than a village when Mrs. Borden's father settled there. John Tallman Whitney, long associated with shipping interests on the Great Lakes. Mrs. Borden, Mary D. Uh, Garmo, was one of seven children and passed on many of his lovable qualities to her son, William Whitney. But there was something more important that she passed on to this child, for when William was about seven years old, Mrs. Borden entered upon a new experience spiritually, which was deeply to affect his life. A devoted mother before, she now became an earnest, rejoicing Christian. To her, Christ was real and fellowship with him satisfying in no ordinary degree. Instead of losing everything, when she turned to him from the gaieties and allurements of the world, she found that she had gained not only peace with God, but a new zest in life, a new joy in home and loved ones. New friends were brought into the family circle, new interests and ideals filled her life. In the Moody Church, to which she transferred her membership, she found opportunities for service in the clear Bible teaching she coveted for the children. The result was very evident in the life of her younger son, who owned the strength and grasp of these spiritual convictions largely to that church. It was there he took his first step to open confession of Christ. Seated by his mother, one Sunday morning he heard Dr. R. A. Torrey, then pastor of the Moody Church, give the invitation to the, to the communion service about to be held. Is it not time that you were thinking about yourself, William? Her mother whispered. I have been, was the unexpected reply. When the elements were handed from pew to pew, to Mrs. Borden's surprise, William quietly took the bread and wine, as did those about him. Rather taken aback at this interpretation of her question, Mrs. Borden mentioned the matter to Dr. Torrey, who smiled and said, Let him come and see me about it tomorrow. Young though he was, his answer to Dr. Torrey's questions made it evident that he was ready for the step he had taken, and the interview led to his joining the church in the regular way. Another important decision was made when Dr. Torrey gave an opportunity for all who wished to dedicate their lives in the service of God to indicate this purpose by raising for prayer. He made his meaning very plain, that it was a step of life consecration. William quickly rose, a little fellow in the blue suit, sailor suit. He had to stand long, long time while the service went on, but there was no wavering, and it was a consecration from which he never drew back. Dependency upon prayer and love for the word of God were becoming even then the warp and the woof of his life. Getting off to school was a rush for him as for other boys. He hated to be late, and with books strapped on his back and cap and lunch box in his hand might be in a tarrying hurry. But somehow there was always time for the little word of prayer with mother without which the day would not have been right. They would just drop on their knees together and pray that William might know, in his experience, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. That was their daily prayer in those early years, and later it was that the will of God might be done in his life. As to his love of the Bible, Mrs. Borden can never forget the picture she saw one evening on going to his room with the children and had returned from a delightful party. Instead of finding William undressing, there he was, just as he had come home, in his velvet suit with neat breeches, pumps, and a stiff collar, seated on the edge of the bed, eagerly and sincerely reading his Bible, from which he looked up at her with beaming eyes. Later, on a journey round the world, his companion remarked that however long the day of sightseeing might be, the boy never failed to close it with Bible reading and prayer. All through college and seminary, it was the same. Strenuous as life was for him in their Princeton home, with all their work in theology, religious and social claims, business responsibilities and examinations looming ever in the background. When his mother went to his study the last thing at night, it would be to find him deep in the book he loved, from which he would look up with the same light in his eyes. End of chapter 1 of Borden of Yale, own 9. Written by Mrs. Howard Taylor, read by Peter John Parisis.
Borden of Yale, 09, written by Mrs. Howard Taylor. Chapter 2, The Hill School, 1902-1904, AET 14-16. Quote, What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. Birthday verse given to William by his mother when he was about eight years old, which became the keynote of his life. The glory of the Hill School when William entered it as a lad of 14 was not its assembly hall and library, its gymnasium or athletic field. Much of the splendid equipment of today had not yet come into existence, but the school had reached high water mark in the last decade of the life of its great headmaster, when what he was among his boys, 400 of them overflowed classrooms and dining hall, may be judged by the inscription on the simple mar marble that re mar stands in its resting place in the ivory-covered cloister of the chapel. John Meigs, strong and temperous, tender, servant of Christ, master of boys, maker of men. His courage was the foundation of the school, his passion for truth, its light. Obstacles are the glory of life, was one of his sayings, and no slackness or slurking was tolerated at the hill. Prompt, alert, indefatigable himself, he demanded the same of all about him, and masters as well as boys awoke under his influence to a new, stimulating realization of what they could accomplish. There was a buoyancy, a spirit of energetic enthusiasm that was contagious, as the headmaster wrote, who had once been on the faculty of the hill. Everybody was systematically yet happily busy. There seemed to be never an idle minute, and the background of the picture was equally satisfying. A combination of perfectly kept equipment and quiet appointments, bestiking good breeding, artistic taste, and culture. Through it all appeared a seriousness of purpose, not obtrusive, yet hardly concealed by the various devices for interesting the boys in the realities of life. Whether in the genteel, comfortable air of the dining room, amongst the varied activities of the athletic field, or in the more rarefied um, atmosphere of the schoolroom chapel, there was the same hardiness and stimulus, physical, intellectual, and spiritual, and the center of it all, the animating story of this city on the hill was Professor. Its ideals were his ideals, and its system was the device of his genius for making those ideals practical and applying them to the everyday problems of life. Footnote from The Master of the Hill by Walter Russell Bowie, from which further quotations are made in this chapter. End of footnote. There was under the influence of Dr. Meigs, it's M-E-I-G-S, a splendid insistence upon the sanctity of the body, its reverent, radiant uses. With all his power he sought to make the boys understand that the strength of the noblest manhood is built on purity, and that impurity is weakness and shame. Self-reverency, self-knowledge, self-control, he believed with Tennyson, lead life to sovereign power. But he was far from trusting in moral training alone to develop the all-round manhood he had in view. A pencil memorandum gives some of his deeper thoughts in this connection. The school must educate, develop, guide, and instruct that spiritual faculty which, by whatever name we call it, is supreme. There is no other restraining power other than religion. Sympathy, the innate horror of doing wrong to the fellow creature. Self-respect, the innate horror of doing wrong to ourselves, are real powers in all finer natures, but a restraining power is needed. 
the power of school mor mor morality will be solved by a religious motive or none. Coming from a great educator, this statement is noble, and the way in which he and his colleagues acted upon it gave the character all its own to the Hill School. The religion which John Meggs led the boys to understand and seek after was no artificial piousness. It was deep and manly and straightforward choice of Christ as plan, master, pattern, and Lord. In this connection we note it. As with the aspiring athlete and the eager learner, so must it be with young Christians. He must be taught to study the great book of rules for daily living, to seek his great captain in difficulty, and to ask for guidance in prayer, to heed the coach who has gained wisdom and victory in his longer game of life, and to share counsels, joy, and confidences in brotherly meetings for prayer. He must realize that the test of this religious life is what he is and what he does when he is not on his knees in prayer, not reading his Bible, not listening to great preachers, and not participating in religious meetings. About the Sunday services of the school, there was the same naturalness and appeal to the boy where he lives. Distinguished preachers came to the regular chapel, but the characteristic thing was the viper hour, where hymns were sung and the men Man who knew and understood them best would sometimes speak and always pray. One of his boys wrote, The real picture of the professor, which always comes clear and distinct from memories of the old school days, is as he sat at his desk in the schoolroom of a Sunday evening at the song service, and the hymn I always associated with him, Easton Feste Berg. That is what he looked and what he was, a firm, strong, kindly, helpful citadel. There seemed to be something in the professor's face as he came down the aisle on, at the close of those song services on Sunday nights, and I never quite caught at any other time a, it's a something words will not tell. And there were other things Hill boys could never forget, among them the professor's utter sincerity and truthfulness and his hatred of everything mean and underhand. They remember that he never stole upon them unawares, but that always his heavy footfall, every ounce of his great frame, telling at every step resounded through the corridors as he approached. And in the memory of that sound, they find their most vivid impression of what is meant by the hatred of shame separativeness and unfairness. Truth speaking and truth loving he considered the very bedrock of character and with these he classed obediency which in his thought stood for working conformity to the right standards of the school which all must accept who accept its life. Obediency not so much to rules as to the high majesty of accepted duty. On this point he could have no refusal and no evasion. To the father of the boy about to be expelled, he wrote, His vital and fatal lack is that of obediency. He has so indulged himself that self-pleasing is the law of his life, and deference to a higher law seems repugnant. Your experience will reinforce my position touching the vital necessity of submission to law as the primal condition of moral as well as physical life and well-being. Dr. Meggs was keenly alive also to the importance of organized games and athletics on account of the moral training they afford and the contribution to purity of life. He was fortunate in having secured the services of Michael F. Sweeney, the holder when he came to the hill and for years afterwards of the world's record for the high jump. A member of the faculty tells us that. He became not only the physical director of the gymnasium and the track work, but also the coach and controlling spirit of the organized games in the school. Between him and the headmaster, there was a sympathy and understanding which grew into the most loving identity of purpose and into all his relationships with the boys. Mr. Sweeney bought not only his technical skill, but the power of a Christian idealism, which left its deep impression on the spirit of many, a lad who would hardly have been reached the, through any other channel. 
Borden had come to the great school well grounded in the principles for which it stood. Sincerity and truthfulness was, were part of his character. One could never think of him in connection with any sham. There was so little self-consciousness about him or morbid craving for appreciation that one who knew him most intimately could say, In all the years I was in close touch with him, I never saw him do anything for effect. A school friend, while he spoke of William as a sturdy fighter, recalled also his reserve and dignity and steady, quiet strength. Outwardly, he was undemonstrable, but his home letters revealed the same warm-hearted, earnest, impetuous boy as of years. September 27, 1902 Dear Mother, today is the first time since I left Boston that we have seen the blue skies or sunshine. It has been raining steady since the evening I arrived until yesterday evening. I like the school very much. All the old fellows are nice to the new fellows, asking us to come and see them in their rooms, etc. My room is in the east wing, second floor, number four. My roommate is a very, very nice fellow, a little older than I am, and two or three inches taller. A great many of the older fellows here knew John, his elder brother. Most of them are six formers. All the old teachers are very nice to me, and they seem very jolly, especially Mr. Ralph, Mr. Hadlock, and Mr. Weed, who, whom I suppose you met. I like Professor and Mrs. John very much from what I have seen of them so far. Many parents came down with the fellows the first day, and even some sisters. Our rooms are very nice. It has two large windows looking out on the quad angle. Under the sill of each is a small window seat, which could be made quite nice if they had cushions and pillows on them. I am taking football for exercise. I am now trying for the second time, but I don't think there is much chance of making it. Last night, they had the first meeting of the YMCA. Trooper Wilder is president, and John Halliburg is vice president. The meeting was great. Throop spoke first, and then a great many of the old fellows got up and spoke. Dwight Meigs led in prayer, and then other fellows gave short prayer. Ending on page 24. This year there are more new fellows than ever, said Professor, had turned away some because he couldn't accommodate them. I sat at Mr. Reed's end of the fifth form table, which is right at the end of Mrs. John's table. Give my love to Granny and everybody. Tell them I expect to write soon. Your loving son, William. October 4, 1902. Dear Sis, I received your letter yesterday and thank you for it very much. As my roommate gets about three letters every mail, I like to get one once in a while. Talk about work. I have six studies. Chemistry, English history, French, Greek, English, and Bible history. The English comp is fierce. We have to make a literal translation of parts of Virgil or C Caesar and, and class changes into idiomatic English. Then again, we have to write on the character of people in the Sir Roger de Carverley papers in the style of steel. We have had two YMCA meetings at one of which Boyd Edwards who was at Northfield spoke. I have joined it. Also my quote wife unquote his roommate Eugene Delerno. Throop Wilder is fine. He is the president of YMCA and of the Atlantic uh, Athletic Association. Athletic Association. I am out trying for the second team. It is pretty hard work. There are a great many Chicago fellows here. Hope you will write soon again. I am your loving brother, Bill. I haven't been homesick a bit. October 26, 1902. Dear Father, Mother says you are working over the plans of our Camden House day and night. I haven't noticed any pictures of summer houses in the magazines. Harry Widener is the son of the man who owns that house you like so much. 
You remember we were looking at it in a magazine at Campton last summer. We have had three football games so far. The first two were at the Hanover Grammar School and Princeton Freshman. The score in each game was 0-0. Zero to zero. The third game was a perfect clinch for us, the score being 41-0 to zero in favor of Hill. Only one goal was missed. Monday, tomorrow, the annual interclass track will be held. I am going into the shot put. It is a handicap meet, so I will have a little show, but not much. I wish you would get me a shotgun and give it me for my birthday so that I could have it down here and shoot a little so that I could go hunting at Christmas vacation. I will be an account of my expenses up to the present time here. With lots of love, your son, William. An accounting. Football supplies. 3.20 posters, $1.05. Contribution, 50 Clothes press, $1.00. Eatables, 20 Screwdriver, $0.14. Cents. Book rack, 20 Picture wire, 20 Class paper, $1.90. Clothes, $1.00. Epps, example, tuck, 30 Paper, 2 Stamps, 10 Epps, 45 Contribution, $1.00. Window cushions, nine ninety eight Stamps, $0.10. Cents. Hill banner, $0.50. Cents. Thumbtacks, $0.09. Car fare, ten cents. Soda, fifteen cents. Pillow, dollar fifty. Reading room fee, one dollar. Apps, thirty five. Contribution, sixty five cents. Total, twenty five dollars sixty eight cents. October twenty sixth, nineteen o two. Dear mother, last Sunday, we only danced for a little while and all sat around on the floor and sang songs. I liked it much more than dancing and hope we will do it again. I suppose you are waiting until November 1st, his birthday, to spend down anything, but when you do, I wish you would send plenty of fruit and cake, and we can have jam, so I wish you would throw in a few glasses of different kinds of jelly, which help along the sandwiches we have daily at 11.43. Mr. Sphere was here today and preached. He was fine. He seems to have changed a great deal. His voice is terribly deep bass. I will have to stop now at the prep bell for bed has rung. With lots of love, William. January 18th, 1903. Dear Mother, we have had good weather lately and today is simply fine. The sky is clear and cloudless. The air is cool and bracing. I am to take a long walk this afternoon with some fellows. About my examinations, I passed algebra easy enough and got a hundred in it, I think, but I did not pass geometry. However, Mr. Shepard let me go into the class and I will try again to pass it Monday and he will help me, sort of tutoring, and I hope to pass it tomorrow. I took an exam in Laura Dune and the result was rather surprising. I got 95 in it. There wasn't a single mistake in spelling or punctuation in the whole thing, and he had not made a single mark of correction anywhere. It was quite long, taking me nearly two hours of steady writing. I have a terribly hard time in studying now. In fact, I scarcely do anything but study. Studying at night, every spare minute from the time I get up until school begins. Then at the recesses. After lunch, I have about an hour and a half spare time. Then I have to prepare my lessons for the afternoon session and then begin the same program again after supper. February 2nd, 1903. Dear Mother, you say you like my hard work. Well, I don't think you would if you knew how terrible it is. I work every little spare minute that I have almost and when Saturday comes you'll just about played out and don't get a decent rest before it begins again the next week and then if you get a third list after working so terribly hard it makes you feel sort of discouraged our English is the worst stuff imaginable it is Carlisle's essay on Burns why is it something awful you can't make heads or tail out of it and it takes about two hours Hard study to know anything about it at all. We look forward to getting through with this term and scratch off a day on the calendar every day. There are now about eight weeks left of 
toil and drudgery. The weather here is awful too. One day it's summer and the next winter. First rain, then snow, etc. I am losing weight quite fast now under Mr. Sweeney's work. I have lost four pounds and lose about three pounds a week. I will soon be a skeleton, won't I? But I guess it won't matter much. Yours with lots of love, William. March 1st, 1903. Dear Mother, I it was very glad to get your letter as I had not had one for almost a week. This evening we had a fine recital by Leland T. Powers of Boston. He gave Monsignor Buchelaire and was simply great. He is wonderful the way in which he can change his voice and expression from that of a woman to that of a man in an instant. You wouldn't think it possible he could change his appearance so much as he does by simply losing up his hair and some other little things like that. After giving M. Bunaire, he gave a short and very funny thing about some old country parson and other country people. This simply kept us roaring all the time. Mr. Fear was here today and then preached both this morning and afternoon. Many of the fellows here criticize him and, and one of the teachers, but I don't think they know what they are talking about. It makes me sore to hear them. I am getting to like Mr. Ralph more and more all the time. He is simply great. Always happy and cheery, never harsh or gruff, except when he has to stop fellows from roughhousing, and even then he is nice and makes a joke out of it or does something else. Just think, only three more weeks of study. If I escape exams, I might be able to leave here Tuesday afternoon or evening, March 24th. My, but won't I be glad when I get out of here. I tell you, it would be a relief to get away from the toil and grind of this place for a little while at least. You must tell me about Johnny and everything you can about Jay, Teddy, and anything that is going on at home. With lots of love to everyone, your loving son, William. March 6, 1903. Dear Mother, I was awful glad to hear from you twice this week. About my coming home and my vacation, I am not in for any exam so far, and I think I am safe for this last week. Now, if I can possibly manage by toil and labor and grinding to keep out for the two weeks more, then I will be safe. Just think, Mother, exams begin the 24th of this month, and I hope to be able to leave that night getting to Chicago the next evening. Only 16 more days and I may be out of this awful working place, and the winter term will be over. You can never appreciate how terrible this winter term is. As for the length of my vacation, it will be just three weeks, I think. That he realizes his hope is evident from the following letter. My dear Mr. Borden, I am very glad to congratulate you on William's excellent record for the past term and to inform you that he is one of the 20 members of the school who have been excused from all their examinations. Faithfully yours, John Miggs, March 31st, 1903. The summer turn brought new and varied experiences. To his mother, he wrote, April 17th, 1903. The trees here have quite large leaves and fruit trees are in full blooms. Everything is fine and I think this term will pass pretty quick. I want you to write me as often as possible and give me all the news about everything you possibly can. Sometimes I feel like punching the fellow's head who sits in the mail window and say, nothing for Borden, three times a day for sometimes three or four days in succession. Tell me about the doings of John, Mary, and baby, etc. April 20th, 1903. Dear Mother, the weather continually simply fine here. Beautiful warm sunshine days, everything blooming as if it were midsummer. We have had a lot of fun now playing outdoors, games, and baseball track, etc. The gun, gun club shooting is good fun, and I have improved greatly since last term. If I keep on improving, I might have some chance of making the gun team, and I will certainly work hard for it. My studies will be pretty hard this term, I think, but I can manage to get along all right, so you won't need to worry. 
This last week, I got two seconds and five firsts in subjects. I came very near forgetting to tell you about the sermon on Sunday. Campbell Morgan was here and preached a fine sermon in the morning, which was said to be the best ever given here. It certainly was fine. It was on Mark 1, 11 and 6, 3. Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and is not this the carpenter? Man's view and God's view. Mr. Morgan demonstrated that it must have been the 18 years of Christ's life on which we know nothing, say that he was a carpenter in which he had pleased God. Then he went on to meditate on how much good an apprentice of his would have gotten. He said he did not think Christ would have talked of heaven or hell, but would have simply given him an example to follow by his everyday life in which there was no blemish. Some of the fellows thought it was a little long, but I did not and wanted more. It was wonderful the way he held everyone spellbound by his talk. For five or ten minutes no one ever stirred while he talked, then as if to relieve the strain he would change his tone. Then the people would shift their position slightly and settle down again and, and so on. It certainly was fine and I hope he comes again. June 14, 1903 Dear Mother, I got your letter from Camden and was glad to hear from you. Now commencement is all over and we have begun work again, at least what's left of us, for there are only 15 or 16 formers here now. On Tuesday morning, the swimming contests were held. Our team was scratch in the relay race and we got second place. In the afternoon, it being clear, the interclass track meet was held. It was very close and exciting throughout. The sixth form won with 43 points. We were second with 40. The next morning, the drill was held on the field. It was not very hot and hence the drill did not seem very bad. Our company did not drill very well, and so we did not get the prize. But right after the drill, the closing exercises were held in the gym. Prizes were given out and also gold medals. Eugene got three prizes of books for excellence in Latin, Greek, and Bible history. I got one in geometry. I am 17th in the school, 12th in on second honor list, and 7th in our form. Lunch right after that was simply grand. Only one table was left in to serve stuff from, and everybody stood up. There was salmon, chicken croquettes, two or three kinds of salad, sandwiches, bouillon, and everything. About half a dozen different desserts. I took a liberal portion of everything and came very near regretting it. November 22, 1903. Dear Mother, it seems a perfect age since I had any communication from the outside world. We have been to Lawrenceville and our team got beaten by a score of 6-5. to five. It seems awfully queer the feeling that football is over. It seems unnatural as if something had come to an end. But I will tell you about our trip to Lawrenceville. I was taken with the team as a sub. We left here Friday afternoon and got to Trenton about 8 o'clock. We went to the Trenton house for the night. It was an awfully old affair. Must have been there in Washington's time. The hallways were a regular uh, labyrinth, and we walked a terrible way before finding our rooms. In the morning, after breakfast, Mr. Sweeney gave us a talk in one of the fellows' rooms. I never knew what he was like before. He was wonderful. He talked to us for about one hour and all points in football and especially fighting. I am sure he's thrilled every fellow. He did me, I know. After lunch, we went out to Lawrenceville. The game was at 2 o'clock. Their team outweighed ours nearly 20 pounds to the man, but that didn't keep our fellows from fighting just as hard. Lawrenceville teams usually have weight, but ours have hill spirit. In the first half, no scoring was done, and the ball was in their territory most of the time. In the second half, we scored a touchdown. Our man was so tired that he missed the goal, which really lost us the game. Then, with only a few minutes left to play, 
The teams lined up again. Their weight told now, and they pushed us down to about our 10th yard line. We held them and punted out. They came on again. We held again, and they came on and crossed the line. They kicked the goal, making the score 6-5. to five. It was mighty hard for our fellows to lose like that, and they all felt mighty badly over it. They played simply fine, and nobody has any kick coming. I hope to be home in less than three weeks from now. Not very long, is it? I'll be mighty glad to get home and see you. I'm going to work these next two weeks, and then maybe I won't have any third week here. Your loving son, William. After the Christmas vacation, January 31st, 1904. Dear Mother, we have been having pretty good weather here and lots of snow. Yesterday we hired a bobsled and went coasting out here on a hill and had pretty good fun. The sled was enormous and one and held nine or ten. The doctor was here today to preach and he was very sad. In the morning he read a thing he called the first chapter of the Ephesians but it wasn't out of the Bible and was as different as you could imagine. Then his sermon wasn't any good and was without a point. In the afternoon, he didn't even try to uh, preach a Christian sermon, but gave us one of the Confucianisms in Japan. He had spent about 20 years in Japan and is quite an authority on it. This was about some fool on a class of fools and the point was what we had come into the world for. It was better, I thought, that his morning attempt, but nothing much at that. He is a teacher or something at the Union Theological Seminary. Gene thinks it's the best in the country and says practically everyone goes there to prepare for ministry. I disagree. And he said his grandfather had founded it. I then said that it had probably changed a great deal since that time. That man getting up there and reading his text out of some book, which didn't resemble a Bible in any way, just made me tired and fixed him for me. I thought how bad things are getting to be. I didn't know, and don't know whether I told you about Mr. Weed or not, but anyway, he was off nearly two weeks. His mother was expected to die at any moment, but she didn't, and now she's recovered. As a result, he's feeling mighty happy and thankful. In Bible class tonight, he read about the miracle of the wine at the marriage feast. Then he said that it was the modern idea that the man who believed in miracles was way behind the times. But he said things would happen in our lives so that we would have to believe in them. He said, I have seen miracles within the last two weeks and believe in them. It was good that after some of doctors trash, I know you think the same way and it makes me tired to hear all this talk about the old beliefs. Mr. Weed is going to put the lights out in just a minute and I will have to say good night. Your loving son, William. Happily for the boy's faith, he was well grounded in the word of God, and so that anything that seemed to him contrary to the truth awoke an energetic reaction in his soul. Uh, looking back on these and the similar experiences, he wrote to the committee of the Chicago Avenue Church some years later. I am very thankful that teaching I received at Moody Church and Institute before I was 15 years of age, because it kept me firm in my beliefs in spite of opposition and criticism which I was not able to answer. The great truths of the deity of Christ, his victorious atonement, and the inspiration and authority of the Bible had been indelibly impressed upon me. I was especially impressed by the testimony of our Lord himself to this last matter and was willing to wait until I could go to seminary and be prepared to meet the critics on their own ground. Hoping that the good work may be on and that many may be won to Christ and strengthen the faith as I was, I remain very sincerely yours, William W. Borden. Debates, orations, and the class dance were absorbing as the spring came again, not to speak of the war news from the Far East. February 3, 1904. Dear Mother, I have heard from both Mary and Majoria, and each says she can come. Mary says Miss Kellogg would chaperone her. It was the first I knew about such a thing, and it might have made trouble. But it is all right, and I am all fixed now except to order more flowers for Miss Kellogg. 
we have to get two sets of flowers, one for the dance on Friday night and the other for the show on Saturday night. I have ordered violets and bridesmaid roses to the amount of $6. Then we have to have a rig to go riding in, traumatic club seats, etc. Besides the $14 I spoke of in my last letter, Gene delivered his oration the other night and it went off pretty well. In fact, all the orations so far have been remarkably good and it's up to us who come later to do as well. As I have told you, mine comes Friday, the second speaker. I get scared off and on by spells. I am very much interested in watching this war between Russia and Japan, and I suppose you must be. We rush over to the reading room after breakfast for a glimpse of the morning papers before going to study. The newsboys who sells papers here in the evening goes a has a, a flourishing business and you have to hustle to get one. Japan seems to be doing the Russians up on the sea. I should think you might write to Huntingdon Wilson for news, although it would be rather old by the time it reached here. The remaining letters for the year are missing, save one, which gives a lasting impression of Borden at the Hill. He graduated in 1904, receiving a grade of 83.6, standing fourth in a firm of 48 boys on whom he was youngest. February 21st, 1904. Dear Mother, this morning we had communion service in the new chapel at 8 o'clock. Mr. Spheres and Dr. Cuthbert Hall conducted, and it was very nice. Of course, attendance was not compulsory. Only a few were there. The dedication service was very good. Mr. Fear and Mr. Halls both made addresses. It is after lights now, and I have to say goodbye. Your loving son, William. End of chapter 2. Borden of Yale, 09, by Mrs. Howard Taylor. Chapter 3. Round the World, 1904-1905. to AET 16-17. Quote, something hidden. Go and find it. Go and look beyond the ranges. Something lost behind the ranges. Lost and waiting for you. Go. Unquote. R. Kepling. The war between Japan and Russia was still in progress when, in the summer of 1904, Borden set out on a journey around the world. He had graduated from the Hill at 16, and his parents felt that a year spent in this way would be well worth while before he entered college. It was no small responsibility. Mr. Walter Ertman, that's E-R-D-M-A-M, -M, had undertaken in consenting to travel with him. Scholarly, brilliant, full of humor, recently graduated from Princeton University and Seminary, a more delightful companion could hardly have been found. But his chief recommendation in Mr. and Mrs. Borden's eyes lay in his fine Christian character. I remember our talks about William down in the pine grove at Camden. He wrote years later, when you were wondering what sort of companion I should make for him, and I was wondering how I could measure up to your ideals. He remembered also Mr. Borden's helpfulness when seeing them off from Chicago. Partly in boy's bravetto, William prolonged his farewells, singing on to the train when it was already in motion. William called his father sharply, Don't do things like that. It isn't fair to Mr. Ertman. It was a word of caution that was not forgotten, wrote the latter, save possibly on two occasions. Once, when he was clambering over the fortifications of the old castle at a J M E R E, and once when his familiarity with nautical matters and the management of a yacht tempted him to climb thoughtlessly on the rail and swing from the halogen of an ocean liner, the captain administrated a sharp, sharp rebuke on that occasion. William called him an old stiff in private, but he came down. It was inevitable that a boy of his physical endowments and active disposition should be on the whole more interested in doing than in seeing things, and one does not wonder that he was more enthusiastic over a swim in the phosphoristic sea than in the shrine at 
Kalmakura that in studying the wonderful lines and graceful bulk of its great bronze Buddha, he remonstrated with me a little for being willing to see it twice. One might have supposed that so active and independent a nature would be impatient of advice or restraint. Yet, excepting the occasions mentioned, his activity never gave cause for concern, and there was no time when he failed to accept suggestions or recognize the force of another's judgment. It was a September day when the SS Korea put out from San Francisco. Fog hung over the Golden Gate, and the departure seemed a small affair compared with the outgoing of the transatlantic liner from New York. What Borden thought of it all may be seen from his unstudied letters. September 20th, 1904. Dearest Mother, we are off at last, and so far it seems quite nice, although in some respects a little speck disappointing. We went down to the wharf quite early, and our bags were taken up to the room by a lot of little Chinamen dressed in dark blue with a round black hat with a red top knot on it. They were certainly very funny and cute. Most of them take the end of their queue and put it on their coat pocket. Our steward is a very nice Chinaman dressed like the ones I have just described. The scene at the dock was quite queer, very different from the departure of an Atlantic steamer. Chinamen swarmed everywhere and there were also a good many Japs mixed in. All the servants and sailors are Chinamen, and they seem to be very competent. Some of them are comical in their appearance and actions, and I enjoy watching them, especially the sailors about their work. Our fellow passengers are mostly married people. In fact, there aren't more than half a dozen young folk that I have noticed. The Chinamen are by far the most interesting bunch. There is an open space between the promenade deck and the poop where they congregate, fat, thin, old, and young, some uh, with gray quays and others with black. I watched them eating this afternoon from with their chopsticks. About ten of them squatted around one pot of rice and with a pot of some sort of meat. Each man had a little tin pan which he filled with rice. They ate by holding the pan up to their mouth and then shoveled in the rice with their chopsticks while they held in one hand. They picked up pieces of meat with their chopsticks and smeared them round in the common bowl of gravy. Some of these groups were scattered over the deck and it made a very queer spectacle. Dear Mother, September 21st, 1904. Today we have gotten pretty well settled and had had a chance to look around a bit. Our chairs are located on the port side near the forward end of the promenade deck. Our neighbors are a couple of young men starting out as missionaries. They are Jones and Gibb, and were on the train with us coming out to San Francisco. Then there is a Mr. Lamb and his wife and little boy. Mr. Lamb is a classmate of Walter's, and he and his wife are going to the Philippines as missionaries. They are very nice and awfully jolly. Mr. Lamb and I got permission from the chief engineer and went all through the engine room. One of the assistants showed us over and explained everything. He also took us into the stroking rooms, of which there are five or six. It wasn't necessarily as hot as I expected. In fact, I don't believe it troubling the strokers at all. The strokers are Chinese and they work for $7 a month. Rather small wages, isn't it? Whenever they get hungry, they haul out a few coals, build a fire right on the floor, and cook themselves some chow. It seems that there are a lot of Chinese on board who travel back and forth just to gamble. They certainly do it with a vengeance. Today revealed five or six new games, and they were busy playing most of the day. The color of the water out here it, as it surges away from the ship is remarkable. It is a deep indigo blue and doesn't seem to be affected by the color of the sky. A day at Honolulu where the water was like melted opals and coloring and clear as crystal was welcome. 
Native boys, eager to dive for money, swam out to meet the ships, some of whom, scrambling on board, took off even from boats on a hurricane deck. The Ackerman, with a rainbow-colored fish, bathing, surf riding, and a dive to various points of interest, made the time pass quickly, until a fresh continent of passengers came on board, wearing wreaths of flowers after the custom of the island, and the journey was resumed towards the setting sun. Tuesday, October 4, 1904. Dear Uncle Fred and Aunt Laura, I received the round robin to which you contributed so much, and thank you very much for it. I often wish to be sailing, yachting, out here, where the trades blow steadily and the sea is comparatively smooth. Going round the world may be quite a trip, but it isn't anything uncommon among these passengers. They are three or four who are on their fourth trip around, and several on their third and second. So we sank into insignificancy. We have a couple of German and Austrian counts and countesses, an Italian doctor, and also several German university men, one with scars on his cheek. Then there is an admiral of the U.S. Navy and a bishop. So you see, we have quite a few celebrities. We have only seen the smoke of one boat since we left San Francisco. The Pacific is quite large. With love, your nephew, William W. Borden. His respect for the Pacific was further increased by the encountering a typhoon before they reached Japan, as we learned from his journey. Strong breeze from the southeast and fairly big sea running. Lifelines put up on the lower deck and all awnings taken down. Wind taken to a gale in the afternoon. Hove to about seven and rode typhoon during the night. Rained hard early in the morning with wind still blowing a gale. Engine started and kept at half speed from 5.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Ship big seas over the brow. Sea quiet down in the afternoon and full speed was put on. Next day they were at Yokohama. Japan was not the fascinating vision it would have been had they visited in the spring when the cherry and Worcestera were in bloom. Fall colors touched the hill with beauty, but it was more the people than the country that appealed to Borden. Fifty years only had elapsed since Commodore Perry had effected, in 1853-54, the introduction of the island kingdom to the family of nations, and only thirty years since the infamous Iwakura Commission had been sent out to survey the world and call its best for the future development of Japan. But what had not that brief period witnessed of progress along the lines of national education, re-representative government, and faculty of communication? Hundreds of miles of railway connected all the important cities of the main island, where previously there had been none. Schools, colleges, and universities had sprung up in which tens of thousands were pursuing an updated uh, curriculum into the worship of the imperial line, which had occupied the throne for more than 2,000 years, had been added modern parliamentary government with a constitution granting liberty hitherto undreamed of in an oriental lands. Side by side with all this had gone territorial expansion and increase the prestige and population. The war with China concluded 10 years previously had brought Formosa under the sovereignty of Japan and the war with Russia, still in progress, had raised her to the first rank among naval and military powers. So it was a new Japan in which our travelers came, and yet the old was everywhere present, and the mingling of east and west was almost bewildering. In the fine station at Yokohama, for example, the clatter of wooden clogs on the pavement was deafening, and in the narrow oriental streets it was alarming to see children playing almost under the wheels of modern vehicles. One of his first letters was to his young sister. Imperial Hotel, Tokyo. October 13, 1904. 
Dear, dear Joyce, I wish you were here to enjoy all the funny little people with your queer ways and dress. I know you would have a beautiful time, but as you can't see them, I will try and tell you about them. I never saw so many children before as they are here in Japan. They seem to be everywhere in groups of four or five and sometimes more playing in the streets. None of the boys and girls that run around wear any socks, but they all wear queer little wooden clogs that they hold on with the big toe and the next one. I would, I should think they would keep coming off all the time, but they never do. The little girls all wear kimotos, something like Mary's only but prettier, some of them being all gold and red and purple. As soon as their hair is long enough, they do it up in a queer little bunch on the top of their head, uh, just like their mothers. None of the girls or women wears any kind of hat as it would muss their hair all up. The boys wear the same kind of shoes and kimotos as the girls in their hair is fixed up different. It is clipped quite short in a ring all around the head. Then right on top a little round spot is shaved to make it look nice. The Boys, or at least a good many of them, wear little soldier hats and look very cute. Girls, littler than you, go around playing with a tiny little baby tied on their back. The baby hangs there in warm weather with its little bare feet hanging down and in cold weather is all bundled up so that you can only see the top of his head. The baby sleeps whenever it feels like it and the little girl goes right on playing just the same. Do you think you could sleep while I'm running around with you on my back? I don't. All the boys and girls seem very good. It is rare to see one crying unless it is very young or has been hurt. They haven't any toys to speak of, although there are plenty in the stores, yet they seem to be very happy and have a good time. The newspaper men, not boys, go running through the streets shouting the news with bells jangling at their waist to attract attention. They are mostly extras that are sold in this way, and the paper itself is about the size of a sheet that I am writing on. When it rains, the people all carry big paper umbrellas, some of them very pretty. Some of the men have big straw hats instead of umbrellas, and sometimes a whole suit or a long coat made out of this rice straw. I shouldn't think it would be very dry or comfortable, but they wear them anyways. With lots and lots of love, William. Their first railroad journey was a short one south from Yokama to the shrines of Kamakua, which, about which he wrote to his mother, October 9, 1904. At the station we took rickshaws and went right to see the Dala Butsa, that's B-U-T-U-S, footnote. Buddhism has been in Japan for four centuries before it could be said to have become part of the national life. The colossal image of Buddha, the D-A-I, then B-U-T-S-U, -S was erected in commemorative the wedding together of the welding together of the alien faith first brought over by Korean missionaries with the indigenous cults of Japan. The copy used in the construction of this magnificent image was to represent Shintoism, while the gold was to represent Buddhism. And a footnote. We approached the statue by a stone walk through a very pretty garden. Only there wasn't a bit of grass. On account of the trees, we couldn't see the statue until quite close to it. It is very impressive and remarkable piece of work, considering it dates from A.D. 12. 43. Around the image foundation stones may be seen in the ground. These supported the temple that once covered the statue. It has been long gone a long time ago as a result of tidal waves. From the Dalai Butsa we went to another Buddhist temple on the top of the hill all over overlooking the sea. This was the temple of the goddess of mercy and there were many small idols round the walls. One of them was all stuck up with pieces of paper. These are prayers and a string of them hangs nearby 
to which the worshiper helps themselves. After chewing it a while, he throws it. If it sticks, the prayers are answered, otherwise not. Tokyo, the capital and beautiful Nikko, in the mountains north of it were no disappointment. Through the kindness of a Japanese friend, they were permitted to drive through the grounds of the palace, seeing something of the surroundings of the Mikado. It was who was a hundred and twenty second representative of his imperial line. No other dynasty in the world approaches such a record, and it was so easy to understand the passionate loyalty of the people to a family which they believe to have descended from the gods, and which has given them such a succession of almost uniformly good rulers. Parliamentary government has existed for only 15 years, a time, no doubt, of many thrills on the part of the people, far and near who, for the first time in the nation's histories, were taking part in the administration of national affairs. Nico, October 16, 1904. Dear Mother, at present we are at Nico, a beautiful spot up in the mountains. In the valley is a very pretty little stream, and the mountains are covered with maples, which are just beginning to change their colors. Well, I must go back and tell you of what we did in Tokyo. Last Wednesday, we were shown through the Houses of Parliament by a very nice chap. He took us into all the various offices, and we saw the pictures of the several presidents, etc. The room in which the representatives meet is simple and not unusual. The House of Peers is much more gorgeous, especially the Mikado's office room. This is beautifully fitted with gold lacquer screens and a cloth of gold over the desk. The imperial box also is very fine with such things as silks and gold lace, etc. Friday, we had a very interesting time. In the morning, we went to the school where Mr. Hata teaches and there went to call on a Japanese lady, Mrs. Fuki O. Kama. Her house was in the suburbs of the city in a pretty little compound. After walking through the garden, we came to a very nice house with sliding walls made of rice paper. The maid greeted us on her knees and bumped her head on the floor at nearly every word. While we waited, we were served tea and then uh, informed by Mr. Hattie that we were to be received at another house as Mrs. Karma wished to treat us as very distinguished visitors. So we walked a short distance to another cute little house and after removing our shoes went in. Walt was known Miss, Mrs. Carmi in America so we took the liberty of asking to be allowed to set Japanese style instead of in the chairs offered to us. After we had talked a while Mrs. Karma speaks very good English. The maid came on her knees pushing a tray with tea before her. There were also some small green and pink rice cakes which we had some difficulty in picking up with chopsticks but which were really very good. We were informed that Mrs. Okama was quite rich and that probably accounts for her two houses and also for the gown she had on. It was a kimono with very long sleeves. The cloth was a mixture of brown silk and old gold, and it was simply stunning. In company with Mr. O. Kami, they went to see some war pictures. We arrived at the theater and checked our shoes, as everyone here does instead of leaving their hats and coats. The floor of the theater was divided into little squares, about four feet each way and in one of these we squatted. Between the pictures, tea and cigarettes flourished on all sides. The pictures themselves weren't anything special and we found the people more interesting. A visit to the hospital enabled them to realize something of what the war was costing day by day. We met two officers, both of whom had been fearfully wounded while fighting at Port Arthur. The first one, who spoke English very well, told us a little about it. He said they were so close to the Russians that they could hear one another talking and could throw stones across. Everything was very neat, clean, and comfortable. 
The nurses looked nice in their white uniforms and high caps. We distributed flowers and books and towels, which are appropriate Japanese gifts. Of their journey westward to the for former capital of the islands, lovely Kyoto, he tells in more than one letter, for they stop by the way to obtain near views of Fujiyami, to enjoy the hot springs of a remote uh, valley, and to climb passes from which the clouds lifted, giving glimpses of the sacred mountain after one climb. We had a hot sulfur bath, he wrote, which was simply great. The Japanese tubs were made of wood and are about three feet deep and oblong in shape. Instead of climbing into them, you step down. I think they are fine and enjoy boiling in them up to my neck. I am afraid they will spoil me for any others. To reach Nagoya, that's N-A-G-O-Y-A, they had to travel part of the way on a man-powered railroad. The car we got into was a perfect cube, measuring about five feet on a side. It was meant to seat four, but at various stages of the journey, we had a number of fellow passengers. Three coolies pushed us slowly up the hill and then jumped on while we coasted down at a terrific rate. Just why the car stayed on the track going round sharp curves, I cannot tell, but it did, and that's the main point. Kyoto Palace's garden, temples, and shops were of the finest, but they found, as Dr. Charles Erkman wrote on his later visit, that it is a city wholly given to idolatry. Of course, one will enjoy a visit to the grounds and buildings of the Mikado's Palace. He will struggle against the temptation to bankrupt himself in the shops, which are the most attractive in the land. But his real concern in Kyoto will be with its countless temples. We rambled through acres of these, carefully depositing our shoes outside in the rain and walking in cloth slippers over vast expanses of polished floors and becoming more and more depressed by realizing the familiar fact that a proud modern emperor, one of the five great powers of the world, is in the deepening grasp of false religions and degrading cults. Of one of the temples at Kyoto, Borden wrote, November 5th, 1904, The most interesting temple we visited was the Shangyi Sangyi-gudo, it's S-A-N-G-U-S-A-N-G-U-I-D-O, or Temple of the 33,333 33, Gods. The building that contains this outfit is a shabby-looking place about 400 feet long by 60 wide. The images all represent the same goddess, K-I-V-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Goddess of Mercy. They are made of wood and gilded. Right opposite the entrance is a huge image, said to be carved out of one willow tree. On either side are 500 idols, each about 5 feet high. They are arranged in 10 rows of 50, each row rising above the one in front of it. The images are meant to represent the 11-faced, thousand-handed goddess of mercy but they only have one face and 21 pairs of hands. I suppose it would have been too much work to make them all. And the 33,333 are obtained by counting the small effigies held in the hands and on the halos of the large ones. It is a very strange sight. Footnote. 70% of the population of Japan, which is given at 78 million, is to be found in rural districts. They live in hamlets of which there, there are 56,000. Scarcely any penetration has as yet been made by missionary forces into this rural area. Even near Tokyo, there are large districts in which the missionaries are only as one to more than a million of the population. Over 40 million, it is stated, are even today practically untouched by the gospel. To these farmer folk, fishermen, and boat people, 
Idolatry is a very sordid thing. It leaves unmet the real hunger of the heart. The Missionary Review of the World for October 1903. End of footnote. In the midst of all he was seeing and doing, these were the things that went deepest. There is one picturesque letter on Japanese paper, six inches wide and seven feet long, in which he gives a detailed account of a display of national wrestling at uh, Os Osaka, which they watch for hours. But there is another letter written to his mother that shows what his first contact with heathenism was meaning in his own life. He had been less than a month in Japan when he wrote, Kyoto, November 3rd, 1904. I have received, received your birthday note with all the others, which was a very pleasant surprise. Your request that I pray to God for his very best for my life is not a hard thing to do, for I have been praying that very thing for a long time. Although I have never thought very seriously about being a missionary until later, I was somewhat interested in that line, as you know. Footnote. At the Hill School, Borden had been chairman of the Mission Society Band. End of footnote. I think this trip is going to be a great help in showing things to me in a new light. I can't explain what my views were, but I met some pleasant young people on the steamer who were going out as missionaries, and meeting them influenced me. Walt had so many friends here whom we met in nearly every city that I have seen a great deal of the work that is being done. While talking with them, we learn of the work of, and the opportunities, etc., so that I realize things as I never did before. When I look ahead a few years, it seems as though the only thing to do is to prepare for the foreign field. Of course, I want a college course and then perhaps some medical study and certainly Bible study at Moody's Institute, perhaps. I may be a little premature, but I am beginning to think a little different. I don't know what you will think of this, but anyway, I know you can help me. With lots of love, William. End of chapter 3.